And welcome back to this special edition of Talking Europe on France 24. Between the 22nd and the 25th of May, over 350 million EU citizens will be able to vote in the European elections, electing 751 MEPs or members of the European Parliament. One thing is sure, the economic crisis has severely damaged the, the image of the European Union. In May, many disillusioned Europeans are expected to remain at home or endorse anti-EU parties. Let me introduce you to my guest here at France 24. I'll start with you, Raquel Garrido. Welcome. You're a lawyer and international spokesperson for the Parti de Gauche, the French equivalent of Die Linke in Germany. So you're a party to exactly. the left of the Socialist Party. Yes, and I'll uh, be running for the European elections. In Greater Paris. Or not. Or, or not. Or you're somewhere still deciding. In somewhere okay. in France. Okay, somewhere in France. Also with us, Eva Jolie, another um, magistrate uh, known across Europe as a Franco-Norwegian anti-corruption judge. You were elected to the European Parliament in 2009. A member of Europe Ecologie the Greens, you represented your party uh, in the 2012 French presidential elections. Also with us, uh, representing... Uh, the centre, the centrist uh, UDI Modem Party, Carole Ulmer. Welcome to uh, Talking Europe. You're a, a member of the civil society, um, also an expert on Europe, and you will be running in the uh, northwest, northwest constituency. That's uh, Lille. Uh, yes, and Normandy and Picardy and okay. the north. There'll be a lot of campaigning for the three of you, and I think it's very important because when you look at the figures, mm. uh, in the last election in 2009, only 40% of the French took to the polls. Uh, turnout was very low, and it's been declining every year, Eva Jolie. There is a risk that this year even less French people uh, will bother uh, to go out and vote. What is your message? that it is very important to vote and uh, that the new parliament has, since the Lisbon Treaty, much stronger powers and that this treaty is now in place and uh, that we can, we can stop the Trans-Atlantic Treaty, for instance, if uh, people like uh, the, us the, the are possible elected. free trade agreement between yes, exactly. the EU and the uh, US. The, the treaty that is negotiated by the Commission on mandate from the member states can only be signed with the approval of the Parliament. So my message to the citizen is that this is paramount because if this treaty is signed, it is an end to our way of life. It will definitely be, I think, the issue, the main issue, at least in the French election. We're trying to make this uh, a referendum on the treaty, on the transatlantic treaty. The citizens really have to get involved and understand that, that any other discussion on French politics or European politics is pointless if this treaty uh, comes into force. So, you know, the French have been harmed by past uh, decisions regarding Europe. You know, that there was a referendum in 2005 where the French voted no, uh, and nonetheless, the government went on and, and adopted and ratified the, the Lisbon Treaty. So there's a sense that what's the use in getting involved in these European issues? Well, there's, there's, a, there's need here for, for, for criticism, there's need for citizen participation, and we need to say no to, say no to what's being organized in our backs by the European Commission. I remind our viewers that the European Parliament is the only democratically elected body uh, at EU level, so whatever they will choose will matter. Uh, Mrs. Ulmer, on the Transatlantic Treaty, I believe your party has a different uh, position, but how will you make sure that the French will take part in these elections? Well, the French are definitely at the forefront of the, of the battle uh, in, the, in this uh, negotiation. And it's true that it's a very important role for the European Parliament in this negotiation. And I think it, we should even foster the role of our MEPs in the European Parliament. Because what, what is important? It is to also defend our norms, our standards, uh, environmental standards, for instance. Uh, we, we don't want to have chlorinated chicken in our, uh, in our food. Uh, so this is also a very important battle to, to fight. But to be very clear, we also have some gains to make from this uh, agreement if we manage to be strong enough to defend our position together in Europe uh, against the end with the United States. I want to make one remark. 
the mandate is also to set up a special institution for commercial conflicts, multinationals against states. Mm -hmm. They want not that these conflicts to be judged by the national uh, 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 institutions, but by one special one. And that we have seen in Ecuador. We know what uh, uh, Texaco, Chevron and Ecuador, they won using their bilateral treaty saying that they have no obligation to depollute. So you don't want, obviously, multinationals no. to have this too much power over the, the, yes. the member state. Now, it's interesting that, actually, thanks to this uh, possible free trade agreement, you seem to have found the, the, the right issue to debate with uh, your voters. Now, I want, I want to uh, move on. And as we heard in the, in the first part of uh, the debate, for the first time, there will be candidates representing the big parties. Your party, Evangeli, the Greens, uh, yes. selected uh, uh, José Bové and Ska Keller. Yes. Um, the left has Alexis Tsipras, mm -hmm. the Greece. emblematic uh, leader uh, from Greece. He was anti-euro, now he seems to be pro-euro, but still. Quite no, critical. Quite I think, critical. I think, I think that our position is, is quite clear. Um, there is a left and a right in mm -hmm. Europe. Uh, we have eco-socialist positions to stand for, and we're confronted with a, a pro-finance pro -finance commission and, and the central bank. So mm. that's the way you have to lateralize the debate. Mm. It's not whether you're pro-Europe or not pro-Europe, because we're all in Europe. And mm -hmm. so uh, we, we try, you have to point at the right enemy. And our enemy is the European oligarchy. And that's why Alexis Tsipras, being uh, the leader of that small um, uh, Greek left that used to be small but now is, is right near uh, power in Greece because of the, 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 the profound damage that the, Euro, the European institutions uh, committed in, in Greece, well, that's, uh, I think, a great symbol that things can change. Yes, the tables turn. Uh, now, the, the Liberals uh, selected uh, Guy Verhofstadt, a former Belgian Prime Minister who is currently uh, the chair of the Liberal Group in the European Parliament. Having a candidate, a pan-European candidate, will it be a, a game-changer? Yes, definitely. I think so. Because we will have a true European campaign with a figure and people can identify with this figure. We will have also programs uh, that will uh, circulate uh, in all member states and we will see uh, these people uh, uh, in debates on television. So I think this is very important. But I wanted to add also something. It's true that the Europeans want some change in politics. There, there, there has been a, a, a general mistrust uh, toward politics, but the change can also come from uh, different parties. In UDI Modem Les Européens, we have also organized this change. We have opened our party to civil society members, and I'm one representative of this civil society. So it is also possible to change politics from within the parties. Now, Eva Jolie, I want you to react to our next report. First, we're going to watch it. It's about the common agricultural policy. Yes. Some like it, others don't, don't like it, but it's an icon of what Europe has achieved so far, and it's the biggest budget expenditure for the European Union. Uh, the CAP, as it's known, a uh, system of subsidies, provides farmers with a safety net so they can produce enough for European citizens to eat and ensure Europe is self-sufficient in food. Now, since the EU introduced the cap in 62, the policy has changed several times. Claire Williams, Alex Le Bourdon and Dunia Noir went to visit two French farmers to find out what they think of the new cap. The future's looking up for this small-scale farmer. Gilles Menou owns 50 hectares of land south of Paris where he grows cereals. He'll benefit from reforms to the cap designed to rebalance the system so small family farms get a bigger slice of the cake. Next year, farmers will get an extra subsidy for the first 52 hectares of their land. The spirit behind the reforms is going in the right direction. But there's still a long way to go. The redistributive payment for small-scale farms could have been a lot bigger, and it's being put in place too slowly. The EU plans to allocate 30% of the CAP's budget to these payments, but farmers will only see 5% worth in 2015. Lobbying by big producers has slowed down reforms. The CAP is a lifeline for many. Once a year, Alexis Giraudet carefully fills in his declaration form. For me, the CAP payments amount to more than I actually earn, even though the payments are getting smaller and smaller all the time. If they were to be stopped altogether, I'd have no income at all. 
With 95 hectares to his name, Alexei feels forgotten by the reforms. His farm is too large to fully benefit from the so-called redistributive payments. But unlike the big producers, he can't compensate for decreasing subsidies by selling more produce. Subsidies are falling. Expenses are constantly going up. And market prices can rise and fall dramatically year after year. If we're going to make any money, we have no choice but to adapt. To earn a living, Alexei has diversified his crops and is going organic. He'll soon apply to be a certified organic producer. Green measures are key to the newly reformed cap, which favors sustainable farming techniques. Eva Jolie, I've heard so many things about the camp. Some told me, look, this is the embodiment of uh, European bureaucracy, ideology. Others told me, you know what, if it weren't for the camp, we wouldn't be able to survive. There would be no agriculture in Europe. Where is the truth? <clears throat> the cap has been very important during 40 years for European agriculture, and especially for France. That was the part of the, the, of the European Union that really benefited to France, to France agriculture. But it has created a very productive system with a lot of entrants that are today old-fashioned. You are destruct, destructing the soils and the agriculture. The farmers do not have a good life. And um, we try to change it now in this negotiation in 2013, but we were defeated. With the Greens, we wanted a much greener cap and a much more sustainable agriculture, better for the health of everybody. But I can say that national selfishness, French national selfishness, supported first by UMP and then by the socialists, they didn't want it because they gave in on the lobbies. So this is a very bad deal, continuing to favorize productivism and uh, you know unfair export. This European cap has destroyed a lot of African agriculture because they cannot compete. Raquel Garrido, when you will be campaigning, I'm sure you'll be meeting a lot of farmers, a lot of them rather disillusioned about the European Union. What will you tell them? Well, first of all, that that those small farmers uh, you showed, I think, um, are, uh, are a, a great image for those big agro agricultures that want to keep the system as it is. Uh, let us not forget ever that one of the biggest persons um, earning money from CAP is the Queen of England, for instance. Yes. That, that's the sort of reality mm -hmm. you could also show when you talk about um, the CAP. And, and, at, and indeed, what we need to, to, to understand is that Small farmers, actually, um, by defending themselves, also defend us, the citizens, because what we need for the future is that sort of small uh, farming. We need to make distances shorter. We, meet, we need to make our agriculture uh, safer for the environment. Mm -hmm. And if there's going to be public money put into an agriculture uh, policy, which is fine by me, it should be used to, be as, as, as to deter anti-environmental um, um, production. That's, that's, that's the sort of thing we should be thinking, how to make sure that not only money does not go to those who are harming the environment, but actually they actually lose because of the money we're putting in the system. It's, it's, it's a stake of humanity. I mean, it's not, it's not just a stake. This, okay. What's at stake is not just, a, you know, the, 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 the portfolio uh, and bank account of uh, some few individuals. Okay, we got you. Now, this program is produced in partnership with HEC, Europe's leading business school. I want to welcome Noël Lenoir. She's our partner on Talking Europe. Noël Lenoir, you are the uh, president of HEC's think tank, European think tank. You've been listening to our uh, debate from the very beginning until the end. What would you like to add? Once again, I think that the, the way you talk about Europe makes people think Europe is our enemy. Of course, it's a bit of a caricature. But uh, I must say that I was a bit surprised to hear with your charming uh, presentation that the European oligarchy is your enemy. That's what you said. Yes, it is. But the yeah. oligarchy in my opinion, mm. is the ones who have influence and who decide. You are part of the oligarchy, no. the EU parliament, <laughs> and the member states in the council, because no, they vote. 
the Commission has no decision-making power. Mm. And you perfectly well know that some of the projects that were presented in the environmental sector with regard to energy, with regard to harmonization of taxes, was rejected by the states. So my view is that why is it that you don't assume your responsibility? You don't claim to be the builder of Europe. Perhaps you, you, you want to do something else, but your vote is important. Mm. And, and the Commission proposed, and you vote. I'll explain why we, I say that. Briefly. Oligarchy, as you, as, you, as you know, means the government of the few. And it, it's, supposed, it, it's a concept that is different from democracy or, or, or republic, which but is for the, the people. In France, we have clear experience that when the people express their uh, political opinion, their sovereign opinion on European policy, that opinion is smashed by uh, the concordance of that oligarchy. So but yes, what we have is a the problem. oligarchy? Oligarchy is the government of the few. And whether it be the, our, represent, our representatives in the governmental side, the council, or in the commission, or in the parliament, that, that all of that is the oligarchy. I don't believe in that okay. separation between the commission defending the community interests and the council defending the national interests. I'm very from the briefly, people in please, France. Very briefly, I'm from, Carole, from the shows left, that and I need and I need my sovereign opinion to be represented and respected. This shows that it will be very difficult to campaign. Yes, we have for energy. Europe at a time where Europe's skepticism is rising across Europe. You've got ten seconds to conclude. <laughs> I definitely agree with Noël Lenoir that I'm tired I'm of scapegoating Brussels all the time. We are all responsible, and that is why I'm a candidate. Date. Okay, to, to. thank you very much to all of you. I'm afraid we have to leave it there because as I was telling you at the beginning of this show, France 24 will bring you a very extensive coverage of the European elections. Six of my colleagues, and trust me, the very best ones, they'll be traveling across the continent in a minivan. This is our tour of Europe. Julie Dungeloff, Aurore Dupuis, Maïssa Awad, Alex Le Bourdon, Claire Williams and Dunia Noir. They're all embarking on a journey that will take them from the Atlantic Ocean to the Carpathian Mountains. I wish all of them a very safe journey and please bring us a lot of reports.